All right, this video is gonna focus on the seller side of the market. So a market is a group of buyers and sellers in the arrangement in which they come together to trade. Uh, and so on this video, we're gonna study the seller side of the market or what we call the supply side of the market. So we're focusing on supply. And just like what we did for demand, we're going to be looking at uh, how much firms, so firms instead of looking to maximize their happiness, firms seek to maximize their profits. They're in business to make money and they want to make as much money as possible. So we want to understand how much would they be willing to supply at, of a certain good at any given price. So we're going to continue to look at pizza and we're going to say, well, how much would you supply? So what is your quantity supplied? QS. Uh, let's change that a little bit. So we want to look at what is their willingness to supply. And this is going to be how many slices they can supply under that willingness to supply. Okay. So their willingness to supply, um, they'd be willing to supply uh, if price is bigger than their cost, but not if price is less than their cost, right? And they'd be willing to supply until price goes all the way down until it equals their cost. And if price equals marginal cost, then that means that they have zero profits. And if price falls below that, they have negative profits, so they would rather not supply. So here, their willingness to supply is also a measure, instead of a measure of like our marginal benefit, for the suppliers or for the firms, it's a measure of their marginal cost, MC. Okay, so here, let's just say that what happens, okay, so if price is 50 cents, they can make one slice of pizza for 50 cents. Okay, uh, if we ask them how much would it take for you to make 11 slices of pizza, right? So an additional 10 slices of pizza, let's say on average it takes them a dollar to make every additional slice of pizza. Okay, and then we said, well, we want 21 pizzas. And then, well, okay, well, 11 slices were okay, but now we want 21 slices of pizza. And at 21 slices, I'm going to have to have an additional oven, so I'm going to have to buy more equipment. Okay, I'm going to have to have another guy come in. So to make more slices of pizza, I have to have more employees, and I have to pay them, so it costs me more money. So as suppliers supply more and more, their marginal cost goes up for slicing that because they have to ha have more ovens, maybe another plant, um, more employees, more equipment, so forth. Okay. So for here, it might cost them a dollar fifty. Then we said, okay, well, for an additional ten slices. So for the next ten slices, that's a thirty-one. Maybe it would cost them on average two dollars per slice. Then for forty-one, two fifty, and fifty-one would be three dollars. Okay. Now let's look at well. If this first slice of pizza costs a firm 50 cents, what happens if price were above that? Okay, well, if price was like, let's say a dollar, they'd definitely be willing to supply one slice of pizza because they sell it for a dollar and it costs them 50 cents to make, so they got two quarters in their pocket to keep. That's their profits. Okay, if price were a dollar, they would sell this first slice, plus they can make 10 additional slices at a dollar each, so they break even. So they make 10 additional slices. Now what happens if price were $1.50? Well, if price were $1.50, they'd definitely make this slice. They'd make these 10 slices because they would sell these 10 for $1.50 each, so that's $15, but it cost them 10 times one, which is $10, so they'd have $5 of profits. And then for the next 10, it cost them $1.50 and they sell it for $1.50, so that's their break even point. Okay, so just like what we did with demand, is we're analyzing willingness to pay and marginal cost and the slice. 
Another way to represent this is what is their quantity that they would supply at any given price? So for firms, they're going to supply up until price equals their marginal cost. If price is below that, they're going to stop supplying. Okay? So a firm, for this pizza company, if, they, if price were 250 they would make 41 slices of pizza. Okay, so we're just going to change this around a little bit. We can also say that this would be what is the price at any given price, what is quantity supplied for that firm. As the price increases, it becomes more and more attractive to make something. I could motivate all of you to start making bead bracelets. I say, I can guarantee that you can sell bead bracelets for a million dollars each. You would probably leave the classroom right now, go buy some beads and start making some bracelets because you're selling them for a million dollars. So I'm motivating all of you to start supplying. Well, if you didn't, I would if I could sell them for a million dollars. So this is our supply schedule, and we've translated it into a graph where we have quantity on the x-axis, price on the y-axis, and here we have And we have 1, 11, 21, 31, 41, 51. Okay, so here's these dots. And notice how we could probably, if we set price something in between, like 75, they might supply 5. So we could break down this price even further, and it would be this smooth line. So we take our quantity supplied at any given price, and that makes this line for us. This is what we call our supply curve. Let me zoom in. OK, so we have price slash willingness to supply and quantity supplied. Okay, so how many they would supply at any given price, which is also a good measure of their marginal cost. Okay, and again, we said firms will keep on supplying up until price equals marginal cost. So what happens in this case if price is, let's say, $2 a slice? Well, if price is $2 a slice, Okay, well, here's where the price is. And we said if price is $2, a firm will supply 31 slices of pizza. Okay, so here, for that first slice they sell it for $2, it costs them 50 cents to make it. So they make $1.50 in profit off that first slice. For the 11th slice of pizza, it costs them a dollar to make. They sold it for $2, so they have an additional dollar of profit from that 11th slice. After they've made 20 for that 21st slice of pizza, it costs them $1.50. They get $2 in revenue from it. So 2 minus $1.50 means that they got 50 cents more in their pocket. And then for that last slice of pizza, it costs them $2. And they get $2, so they make zero profit for that last slice. So if we add together all the slices that they get times their profit for every slice, that would be a measure of their total profits. Okay. So here we're looking at, right, so let's see, they sell 31 slices of pizza, and this is their profit for every slice, is a measure of this distance right here. So the area of this triangle is going to be a measure of their total profits. If price were $2 and they, sold, they made and sold 31 slices of pizza, this is going to be a measure of their profits from those 31 slices of pizza. We call that producer surplus.
or we abbreviate it PS. So we have these profits here. And just like what we do with demand, the opposite of consumer surplus is producer surplus. It's a measure of profits. So we were better off by eating pizza and buying it for $2 in the demand example. And here, the firm is better off making money and selling pizza for $2. So this is a measure of how much better off the firm is after trade. Okay, So consumer surplus measures off how much better consumers are after trade. And this is a measure is how much suppliers or sellers are off after trade. So in this example, they would sell 31 slices of pizza. And so we find the area of this triangle. They sell 31 slices of pizza. The height of the triangle is 1.5. So 1.5 times 30. Let's see. That's 3 times 15 is 45 divided by 2, 1 half base times height. So overall, their total profits after selling these 31 slices of pizza would be $22.50, would be producer surplus. Okay, so they would make $22.50 after they bought all the ingredients and then sold all the pizzas that they made with it. They could walk away with $22.50. Okay, so that's a measure of productive efficiency is producer surplus. So consumer surplus was a measure of allocative efficiency. Pro producer surplus is a measure of productive efficiency. Because if they're selling at the lowest cost or they're producing at the lowest cost, which is what their supply curve is, this is measuring their productive efficiency. OK. Uh, lastly, uh, we, there's two more things that we want to look at here. The first one is the law of supply. And the law of supply says that as price increases, quantity supplied increases. Right? Or vice versa, as price decreases, quantity supplied decreases. Okay? So as the price goes up, it becomes more and more attractive to a firm to produce more and more because there's profits to be had. So they're going to produce as many as they can at a very high price. Okay? And then we can measure their profits by using consumer or excuse me, producer surplus. The last thing that we want to look at is what happens if something other than price changes. So there's other additional factors that would change how much firms are willing to supply other than the price. Okay, So we're going to erase this. And just like what we had on the demand side, where we had shifts in demand, or factors that change demand, we have factors that change supply. And we want to understand how those factors work. So here's my cheat sheet, and here's my working space. So let's, let's suppose that this is my supply curve for pizza, and now that there's a new oven that makes pizza twice as fast. So in the same amount of time, I can make twice as many pizza, twice as much pizza. So Relatively, it cost me less to make pizza than it did before. If pizza costs less to make, at this price, I would be willing to make more pizza because it costs less. If price were higher, this is how much I would have made, but under the new technology, it still costs less to make, so I'd make more. So overall, if we have an increase in technology, the supply of pizza will increase. So again, a third variable. Price and quantity are our two variables on the graph. We have an increase in the third variable. It shifts the curve. 
Okay, so here we have an increase in technology. And an increase in technology will cause supply to increase or shift to the right. Supply and demand never shift left or right. They are, excuse me, up or down. Supply and demand always shift left or right. Okay? Let's see. What happens if there's a change in the price of an input? So pepperoni, or let's say tomatoes. So tomatoes are important to making pizza, right, to make the sauce. So what happens if tomatoes, the price of tomatoes goes up? Well, if the price of tomatoes goes up, then it costs me more money to buy the sauce. So every pizza that I make costs me more money. So if it costs me more money to make pizza, I'm willing to supply less pizza. Okay, so at any given price, if the price of an input increases, I'm going to supply less pizza because it costs me more money to make it. So we have an increase in the price of an input. What we're going to see is a decrease in supply, our supply shifting to the left. All right, what about the price of a substitute in production? Okay, so uh, imagine that uh, we're looking at um, I don't know, um, let's say Apple. So we're looking at Apple and they have a trade-off. So they can make iPads or iPods, okay? iPads and iPods are substitutes in production because they can basically use the same equipment to make iPads and they can use that same equipment to make iPods, okay? So what happens if the price of an iPad increases? Well, if the price of an iPad increases, this is an AD. Then we know that they're willing to supply more iPads. So as the price of iPads increases, they're supplying more iPads because they're more profitable. Well, if they would rather make iPads because they're more expensive, what would happen to the supply of iPods? Well, in that case, for iPods, a substitute in production, it doesn't matter what the price is, they're less attractive to make at any given price. So supply would decrease. So if we have an increase in the price of a substitute of production, we're going to tend to supply less of a good. Okay, so price of a substitute in production. So we're looking at the market for iPods, and if the price of a substitute in production, such as iPads, increases, supply of iPods will decrease. Okay, uh, and then the last two. What happens if we have more firms enter the market? So number of firms. Our number of suppliers. 
well, if more firms start making pizza, there's going to be more pizza available, so the, supply, the market supply of pizza would increase. And then the last one is expected future price. If Apple thinks that next year it can supply more iPod, that the price of iPods are going to go up next year, that means that next year iPods are going to be very profitable. So this year they would rather not sell as many iPods, or they're going to make less iPods this year because next year they're going to be more profitable. So as the expected future price increases, we're going to see a decrease in supply. Okay, so these five factors summarize everything that we need to know about supply. I'll take a minute to jot this down. And that summarizes everything that we need to know about the supply side of the market. So next we want to analyze what happens if we put buyers and sellers in the same room when we say go ahead and start chatting. And we want to see how would they trade? How are they going to negotiate trade? 